And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. The Seven Feasts of Israel God's Holy Days Commemorated by the children of Israel And fulfilled by the Lamb of God That's how we got out of Egypt. Almighty God said to put the blood on the doorposts of the house and, and upon the lintel, and uh, then the avenging angel would pass over us. And so that's Passover. Uh, we were spared. There was death in every other home. There was death wherever they didn't have the blood. And without this night, there was this most dramatic night in the history of Israel, well, there just would be no Jewish people, no prophets, no apostles, uh, no Bible. Uh, the Messiah would have had to come some other way through some other people. Blood is probably the single most important issue in the scriptures. From Abel to Christ, uh, this is the proper sacrifice. Whichever testament I read, I can say the blood of the Lamb delivers me from bondage. When I'm reading the Old Testament, I mean the, the Lamb of the Exodus, and when I read the New Testament, I mean the blood of the Lamb of God. This all fits with the new series that we're undertaking now. We're going to do the seven feasts in another way. We're going to take a whole show for each feast and uh, explain them all in great detail. We uh, had shows previously, of course, on the seven feasts of Israel, but many times combined them all in a show. Or, uh, well, we've taught Passover by itself, maybe Pentecost, but this time we're going to go through them all because I think that this is where so much New Testament doctrine is founded. Uh, there's reasons why we, we get things wrong or we don't realize our roots as, as well as we should. And it's because uh, many times we don't go back to the foundations, to, to the uh, Old Testament truths, the, the types and shadows that God set up. So we're going to do this in high detail. We're going to have uh, an expert with us who I know you like very much, Jean Rosenberg of our ministry, a uh, Jewish Christian lady with many years of experience in celebrating the feasts. She's going to tell us. Uh, how she celebrated them uh, in her youth, and uh, uh, so we'll have uh, the testimony of someone who celebrated uh, the Jewish feast in America, and uh, from from a family that kept the rules and and really did it thoroughly. Then we're gonna have some footage from Israel showing how the people of uh, contemporary Israel do the celebrations, and I'm going to explain from the scriptures how uh, God intended them to be and what they really mean. Uh, really just a fascinating topic. I think you'll like this series very much, and I hope you'll watch uh, each week along so that you get to see all seven. That's very important. We'll be offering you on these shows uh, the Passover book and uh, tape. Uh, this is probably, of all the things we've published, the, the miracle of Passover is, is the most popular. It explains more types and shadows of Messiah than anything else. Uh, since I published this, I suppose we've, we've sent out more copies than any other book. And the tape uh, uh, explains it to you, of course, verbally. It, uh, people ask, what's the difference of the book and tape? I don't know. Some people like to study by tape. You have a vocal inflection to uh, look at, too. You can get it at the post office box address, 12268 Dallas, Texas, 75225. Tonight's program will concern Passover and unleavened bread, which are the first two feasts. Uh, Leviticus 23 gives Passover and then unleavened bread the next night. And uh, they are celebrated as one eight-day festival now, and uh, uh, that is, that's quite correct, and we'll have them in this program. Uh, this program is dedicated by Christian friends in memory of Harry C. Vader. Now, when I say that, you know, uh, a friend of the ministry has sponsored a program. Many people have uh, written in to say, what is that about? 
uh, production costs are one part of making television and uh, 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 you know when they give a show to a person or a memory of a person that's giving it a Bible study to a million people that's many people watch each airing of Zola Levitt live and this show goes on in reruns and so on so that many millions watch it's not that expensive and it's a very good work frankly it helps us a lot so if you want to write for details I'll tell you how you might sponsor a program it's a fine gift to someone uh, someone who's still with us and hasn't gone on to the Lord is just fine well tonight we are going to talk about that first full moon of spring 3500 years ago Passover night you know the United States is just 200 years old but Passover 3500 years old this was established in God's Word, and it's, it's a proof that it must be God's Word. It has survived. It's been tested by time. The Jews do it, of course, every year, and they do it from this Haggadah, the program book of Passover, a very beautiful book, uh, color pictures of everything, where to put it, so they get it right. You know, I often think the church doesn't, uh, uh, there's too much variation from neighborhood to neighborhood because maybe the church is not reading its book. But the Jews are reading theirs, and uh, Passover, you can count on, does not vary from house to house or village to village. Well, uh, tonight, as I said, we have a lady that's read this Haggadah for many years. Let's go over and uh, talk with Jean Rosenberg about her Passovers. Uh, Jean, thanks a lot for joining us on the show. I'm glad to be here. So it's always a pleasure. You celebrated Passover for a great many years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> many, <laughs> and, many years. And you know uh, the traditions. Your parents, let's see, were... Born in the old country, but over here and married in America. Right. Uh, about a, almost 100 years ago. Yes. And so here you are at Passover as a little girl. What happened? How did they celebrate? Oh, it was such a joyous holiday. It was, we looked forward to it. First of all, the week before, we went shopping with my mother. And she would buy matzah, not like people buy a pound or so. There'd be big boxes, 20 pounds, you know. That had to do for eight days. Matzah is the unleavened bread. Right. Yes. And, of course, she bought up the fish that she had to make a filter fish, and that's homemade. And that, that's made with real hot horseradish that she made herself, and the tears streaming down her oh, eyes. Yeah. This was a must. This was a ritual. I still eat gefilte fish all the time. Yeah, but, you know, it never tastes the same as when my mother made it. No, that's true. You know this kosher brand called Mother's. Yeah, when right. it came out, uh -huh. uh, that, uh, we would say, it, my mother used to buy it at the store, sure, frankly. Sure, I still buy it. But then we would say, uh, uh, did you get this at the store? And she would say, this is mother's. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Except she didn't do all the hard work for it. That's it. Uh, it another thing, we got new shoes on Passover. That was one, you know, we were oh, poor people at that time. That was a big deal. So you wouldn't wear the year-round leather. That's right. Well, <laughs> we got new shoes for Passover. Right. Of course, then... We came home, and of course, the day before, we had to clean out the cupboards, make sure everything that was not for the Passover, what we call chomets, yeah. was out. Right. In fact, we'd feed the animals all the chomets we could find because you could not feed the animals even during Passover <laughs> the same as the Jews. You could not feed them chomets. Your, your, your pets of the family kept Abs the law. They had to. So <laughs> if you couldn't, you sold your pets or your animals uh -huh. to non-Jews. Uh -huh. And then after the, the holidays, you probably bought them back and paid more for them than you sold them for. But you couldn't own them during the holidays. Unless you fed them the Passover food. Unless they food. ate the authentic Passover food. Right. Okay. You could not do that. So that was one of the things. Yeah. Uh, of course, then, then came the big deal, the Passover dinner. And... Like this table is set up. Right. You set it's your table. huge. Oh. And you invited, it was a ritual. You, if anybody you knew that didn't have a home to go to, single men, single women, yep. you were, they were invited. We never knew how many we were going to have. It was a big one. And we kids would sit around, and it was a, just something we looked for because it was a joyful holiday. Of course, we used to wait for Elijah. We set a place for Elijah there, and he never came. He's supposed it, to come and announce Messiah. Right. Yeah. And we kept watching the door. We left the door open. Yes. But he never came. No, he <laughs> didn't come to my house either. No. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Yes. <laughs> well, Elijah, we know, will. Uh, well, John came in the spirit of Elijah and announced right. Messiah. We'll see Elijah at the second coming. Sure. But the way we expected it as children, you know, it was yes. all together. More like different. Santa Claus coming to every home. Sure. It was just a big thing. Of course, there were many words that, that in Hebrew that my father would read from the Agata that were funny. 
and we start to giggle. <laughs> right. you, you probably did the same thing. <laughs> I, I won't use the word yes, because they sound funny, but yeah. we giggle so hard we get sent away from the t This was every year. We'd get sent away, and of course, then my mother felt badly because we didn't have any. And she'd so go and get you. Back Something again. happens in my house. And then they make you sit there some more, and then the word would come up again. More giggling. That's back <laughs> again. Back again. But of course, then the youngest one gets to ask the four questions. Okay. We, in Jewish, we say, the, the fear kashas. Fear kashas, four questions. The four questions. And sometimes you get through the four questions, sometimes you wouldn't, you know, children. Yeah. Sometimes we fell asleep at the table. It took so long. Oh, right. Yeah. By the time your father chanted the whole story of the Exodus, oh. uh, eyelids got heavy. Boring yeah. to children. You know, you <laughs> sit there. <laughs> He's in another language. <laughs> but you had to kind of remain alert, at least at first, to grab for the right food in the oh, story. Sure, so. sure. The first part was great because you're alert, you know, we're waiting for yeah. Elijah's coming and yeah. we've got guests yeah. and, and I'm going to ask the fair cushions. Now I'm the youngest, see, yeah. and I'm going to get the honor this year. Everybody was once the youngest child. It's it's a great teaching then. Right, really good. And you think you know everything that you're going to ask, and then you get up there and you ask the first one, the second one, <laughs> and, then, and then your father goes on yeah. droning, you know, it yeah, seems to you, yeah, with the yeah. with the Haggadah. Yeah. And before you know it, it's you're just ready to go to bed. You're not ready for... It's 11, 12 o'clock yeah. before you're through with the meal. God wanted us to uh, remember the whole story, tell it every year. Uh, and uh, and eat a big meal and finish up the lamb. Yeah. Well, Jean, uh, uh, it's certainly been a pleasure. Jean's going to come and be with us on these shows to give us uh, what you just saw, which is a one of a kind uh, understanding of how. Uh, uh, Jewish people, especially American Jewish people, celebrated Passover. It doesn't vary in its essentials, but these little customs uh, that come from uh, this family or that household and so on may be different in different countries. And as a matter of fact, we have some wonderful video footage from Israel, and it's really very authentic, and it shows all how they bake the bread and uh, set up for their Passover, and, and uh, they got the camera right into a home where Passover was going on. So I'll take you uh, through this footage, uh, uh, kind of narrate it the way we go uh, uh, as we go along. Uh, look here at the bakery. Uh, first of all, these are pieces of unleavened bread going by on a conveyor belt. You don't think of an old biblical symbol like this being uh, done in mass production style, but you know, there's a lot of people in Israel and they also import the stuff all around the land and uh, uh, outside the land, so they have to make it in quantity. That doesn't mean that a rabbi doesn't inspect the bakery, make sure that everything is absolutely uh, sterile and clean. Uh, the men that work there uh, have very exact procedures and, and they really sort of have to be licensed to be doing this and uh, uh, they take it seriously. Now here's an old-fashioned style where they make the round pieces. This is an older style of Middle Eastern bread. This man is very good here. He has to have a precise knowledge of just how long that bread is in the oven because if he leaves uh, extra crumbs, uh, uh, then that, the, the batch is contaminated, the oven's contaminated. They have to stop this whole procedure, which is very exacting, and uh, clean it out. They say that if it rises too far, it's, it appears to be leavened, you see. Uh, here's the fellow that rolls the unleavened dough. Uh, working at a certain speed, the other guy picks up the pole at a certain time, he puts it in the oven for a certain amount of time, he takes it out very smoothly with his tool here, and look, uh, he's careful not to break off a crumb, very, very necessary. And of course, the stuff is flat, and it cooks fast, and you've got to be uh, very exact about it. It's, uh, I suppose it's real easy to burn it and spoil it and break it, but the, it seems they never do. Uh, perfectly round pieces. Well, now the bread comes to a Passover table. And so we're moving into an Israeli home here, father there uh, with the uh, wine cup at the end, and I think his father, grandfather of the family. And uh, they are at a table, just like we're going to show you later in the show, our own Passover setup. And uh, the whole family is gathered. Here, here's a young boy. Uh, looks like he's asking the four questions. Very concentrated, going along carefully. That's the only time uh, in the service that he talks, so that would be the four questions. Here are his sisters. Uh, they did this in, in their turn when they were the youngest child. Well, grandfather watches the proceedings with a careful eye. Everything has to be as it was when he was a boy, and so on and so on, back to Egypt. Here's the center plate. This one with uh, a big one with uh, all the unleavened bread and bitter herbs and uh, everything in one plate. 
father uh, shows it to, to everybody and starts the story of the Exodus in answer to the four questions. The four questions are about what happened back then, so uh, of course he tells them. He chants and chants. This is the part where Gene said, you know, you, you start getting a little sleepy. Uh, th these big girls should stay awake, but the little children start, uh, start uh, the, the certain attrition rate. White skull caps for Passover because it's a, a holiday of celebration, not black. And white robes, you see, uh, grandfather in his. Now we're having a ceremony of passing around the bread, and this is very like taking communion. In fact, it's what it is. Uh, uh, the Lord's Supper is a Passover, and you'll see them sharing the bread first. Uh, they break it. They eat some. Uh, you wonder if the Jews take the Lord's Supper? Of course, they do every Passover. And, and uh, the church, does it celebrate Passover? Yes, every time it takes communion, it celebrates Passover. You see it here being done in an Israeli home, and they haven't read the New Testament, uh, more than likely. Uh, this boy's about uh, the same age as uh, Jesus was when he was at the temple asking the good questions and his mother was looking for him in uh, uh, Luke 2.41. Well, it's uh, a beautiful thing, Passover, and, and timeless and uh, uh, from country to country, the same thing, except for, you know, the little family customs that uh, Gene was talking about and so on. It all started in Exodus 12 and 13 with the unleavened bread of Egypt. They couldn't wait around for bread to rise. That was a, a practical matter then. Uh, uh, they cooked it fast in an oven similar to what you saw. That's why those Orthodox Jews do it that way. They think that is more like it was in Egypt, very like it was then. Passover means uh, deliverance, purity, spirituality. The best Passover in history and I know that I'm aware of, I speak because the scripture said it was God's favorite one, was Josiah's Passover in 2 Kings 23, 22, for the reason that he cleaned out the land so well. Uh, he got out the pagan altars and the priests of Baal and so on. The cleaning was so good. The place was pure. And so God said there was not a Passover like that one held ever since the Exodus, not under the judges, not under the kings, and so on up to King Josiah. And that was halfway to Messiah, that is from the Exodus to Josiah, it's about halfway, and then uh, from Josiah to Jesus, uh, uh, another seven centuries or so. Passover begins with candle lighting. The, the candles are lit by the woman of the house, by mother, because uh, uh, a woman brought us the light of the world. Jesus was born. Uh, Adam wasn't born, Eve wasn't born, but Jesus was, and it was a notable birth, one to be noticed because if uh, 30 years later, uh, an honest inquirer, uh, Nicodemus, came to Bethlehem and said, look, I, I don't want to follow the wrong Messiah. Was this uh, Galilean, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, he would call him Yeshua, was he really born here in Bethlehem in this town? And they would say, yes, we remember. He was the baby born in the barn by the hotel. The, all the rooms in the hotel were full. That's something you'd remember in a small town. There were only 400 families in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Uh, also, he needed to be born of a woman so that he's like us and we're like him. He had this flesh. He walked this earth with this equipment. The gospel says he, he got tired, he got hungry, he wept. He was tempted in all things just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Well, the whole story of salvation is told in the foods of the Passover. We eat the bitter herbs. That's uh, uh, your life before you were saved. The blood of the lamb is salvation. The water of the Red Sea, they went in and came out safely. That's uh, baptism. And now we're in the wilderness, ever heading toward heaven, Jericho. Now, there's no symbol on the plate for Jericho. There should be a rose or an orange if that were part of the, the story, if that were the true deliverance. But you see, uh, getting into Jericho is not the end of uh, Israel's problems. The, the battle for Jericho is still on, I'm here to tell you. But anyway, the unleavened bread, and that's part of our emphasis, is uh, uh, what, what, what we're talking about tonight. Jesus came down from the cross in six hours so he could keep the feast. His body was buried on unleavened bread. Our tape brings that out. We're going to go back to one of our uh, fine shows, uh, uh, probably one of the best, uh, one of the Passover shows, where uh, I particularly spent some time uh, explaining the unleavened bread. Father has uh, put away the piece of bread, and he began with uh, a beautiful bag here in which we had placed bread, uh, one in each of three compartments, and we'd pulled out the middle one and broke it. This is the, the half that's left, and we put the broken piece in white linen, 
and put it under the table. Well, at this point in the service, after we've eaten the meal, so there has been a pause of maybe two hours since the piece was, was buried, he brings it forth again. And he gets it out of its bag and pours the third cup of wine and these two, this bread that was hidden, and this cup, the cup of redemption, that is communion. That is the Lord's Supper. That is what it is. It's not like communion. It is communion. When we take communion, or the Lord's Supper, as some call it, we uh, are doing a little bit of Passover. When the Jewish people do Passover, they are taking communion. The two are the same thing. Now, we can uh, pick up the Lord doing this in the gospel in Matthew 26, 26. Uh, you know the verse very well. It says, and as they were eating, he took bread and blessed it, broke it, gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, we know since the verse starts, as they were eating, it must have been the buried piece of bread because they were already eating the meal when he took it. So it's this piece of bread. And uh, then it says he blessed it. What did he say in the blessing? When I ask this in church, um, usually no one knows because this is something that the Jews know. This is something that's in the Haggadah, the book of Passover. In this book, I have all the blessings that are said. But uh, ironically, the Jewish people know Jesus' words and the church usually doesn't. What he actually said was, Baruch HaTor Anoi Eloheinu Melech Olam HaMotzi Lechem in Ha'oretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth, who bringest forth bread from the earth, and he just got this off the floor, and he says, this bread is my body. In other words, God brings forth bread from the earth. There's a little prophecy in that blessing about the resurrection. He is saying, men, if they try to bury my body this week, don't worry about it. It'll just come up again, like this piece of bread. It will come forth from the earth. You cannot bury a kernel of wheat Something else will come up again. The Lord said he was as a kernel of wheat. Uh, he was so like bread. He was born in Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, house of bread. He was buried on the second feast, unleavened bread. And so uh, uh, he, his career was as a piece of bread. He was raised in Nazareth, Netzer, the branch. You see, he was a growing thing. If, I, if I'm raised up, I'll draw him into me and so on. It's a very, very beautiful and subtle analogy. And, uh, you know, the Lord was raised, and when we go to uh, his empty tomb at Jerusalem, we are thrilled to see that indeed it's empty, but I wonder if we realize that all of our tombs will be empty someday, that uh, they'll all be just like Jesus, because you cannot permanently bury any Christian. We'll always rise again. Well, it's uh, one of the great lessons, I suppose, in the Bible, the unleavened bread. And uh, when we did it on our Passover program, uh, it uh, was one of the most popular shows. We went on to talk about the wine. The wine is a proposal by the Lord to his bride. That's how the Jewish bridegroom proposed, by pouring a cup of wine for his bride. You know, I, I think of the uh, uh, blood, the blood of the lamb and then the blood on the cross, two sheddings of blood. And in the, in the Bible, Wine is blood. The Lord said, this cup is my blood. Uh, the second blood is more efficacious. It's better. Uh, the first blood delivered them physically. The second will deliver you spiritually, not just out of Egypt, but out of your sins and out of this world finally. Now, the parallel is to the wedding at Cana. They used up the wine, and then uh, the Lord made more, and the master of ceremonies said, this second wine is better. So when they pour the cup of wine for you in the Lord's Supper, drink it. And when he comes, he'll stop at your house. Behold the Lamb. Uh, he came four days ahead on Palm Sunday uh, so they could examine him. The law says in Exodus 12:4 uh, that they should look at the Lamb four days to see if it's without blemish. Uh, he did that so they could examine him, see that he was a proper Messiah. Elijah's cup that Gene talked about, it's not drunk in the gospel. There's only three cups in the gospel. Why? Because uh, uh, they didn't have to look outside for Messiah to come. The Messiah was at the table. The chosen people are uh, still looking, uh, as, as Gene said. Well, uh, when Father finishes, he says, L'shana haba'abi Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And they sing a hymn, Dayenu, which means enough. 
So that they're saying, they're praying for Jerusalem like as if for the new Jerusalem, and they're saying, enough, enough, we've had enough. Dianu, Dianu, it repeats and repeats. And indeed, he is enough. Uh, Messiah is enough to get to the new Jerusalem. Uh, it, it's a beautiful symbol. And until you have read the New Testament, I, I celebrated Passover for 32 years without knowing what it meant. Uh, I, I listened to my father, but I didn't see this until I saw Messiah, and then it all uh, made a picture for me. Well, that's Passover and unleavened bread. Eight days of celebration of things entirely new. Uh, new dishes, uh, new bread, new life. Trying to understand our world without knowing where Israel fits in is like trying to be a Christian without a knowledge of your Jewish heritage. The heritage lived and spoken of by the prophets, apostles, and Jesus himself. Learn about both worlds with a free subscription to the Levant Letter. This newsletter will also keep you up to date as to the TV stations and times Zola may be seen. The books, music, and teaching tapes Zola offers, as well as his personally guided tours to the Holy Land. Just write Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225 for this timely update for believers. Well, next week's show will be about first fruits, which really ties in what we've come to call Easter, and, and really shouldn't, because that's the name of a Babylonian goddess. But we'll take up next week the proper Resurrection Sunday called First Fruits in the Bible, and uh, we'll explain it in all its details. Uh, we're offering tonight the Passover uh, book and tape, and I, I really hope you'll get this. It's, I'm, look, I'm not a book salesman, and this isn't a bookstore. I want you to have the study materials. Uh, I ask you for support of the show, but we always give you something in return. I need a minimum $10 gift for these materials, if you please, and, and that's just what it cost us to get it together and to make the show for you. So please, $10 gift to the post office box, 12268, Dallas, Texas, 75225, and Sha'alu Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jerusalem.